Hello, everybody. So today I want to talk about how I approach portfolio construction and how I actually build my portfolio. And th this is a good overview of a portfolio. So my, my portfolio, as you may know, is very heavy on specifically one stock, which is, which is Tesla. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly heavy on Tesla. Um, and then I have end phase, which, which is a, an heavy position for me as well. Uh, and I would put these as tier one. I would call this tier one conviction stocks. Then I have in my portfolio, the bulk of the portfolio where I spend most of that, my time. And that's the, the most diversified for portion of my portfolio, which is about 20 stocks. This is not all of them, right? But um, typically, all of, typically most of the stocks I cover on the channel are within that 65 to 70% of my portfolio are within that, that category. Um, and, and those stocks are, are stocks that are that are not a star stocks because there's something um, that makes me, um, you know, more wary to go all in. So an example of that is, for example, whether it's Snowflake, Palantir, CrowdStrike, or Datadog, I am not an expert in the SaaS industry. I don't work in the SaaS industry. I haven't used the products, and thus I don't have a way to judge the product because I haven't used the product. Um, Hims could be kind of a hybrid, but I, but I haven't used any Hims products, so I can't really judge the product. So I can't go all in because I, I I I always have, have that doubt. Nvidia, right? Nvidia. I can't fully, fully judge the product. Uh, then you have specific issues like, you know, Stoneco. I love Stoneco very much, but Stoneco is in Brazil, operates in Brazil. I don't know the Brazilian market. Same for Nubank. I don't know the Brazilian market. Um, you know, Palantir. Palantir has a huge business in the military, and and I think it's it's wonderful. I think it's probably one of, one of the best. It's, it's a great business, their military business. But I'm not in the military, so so. These businesses, I need to, to diversify for the things that I don't know. I, I, I can't have the fullest conviction possible for the things that I can't know, for these, these unknowns about these businesses, which is why I have about 20 different companies, uh, you know, some, some more, some less than others, you know, where I, I am diversified. For the bulk of the portfolio, I am diversified, 65 to 70%. And then, and these two, by the way, would be hyper-growth stocks, what I call hyper-growth stocks, which means very high revenue growth, more than 30%, revenue growth year after year for the foreseeable future. That's why I put these stocks in this category. And those together are 90 to 95% of my portfolio. Uh, so you can see very heavy on my house conviction, but you'll see, I hope you'll see why it makes sense. And, I, and I'll go through it when why it makes sense later. Um, and then I have what I call either exponential growth stocks, either binary growth stocks, or pre-revenue growth stocks. And perhaps the best way to describe those stocks, and I put the ARK Invest ETF in there, that, that's most of the ARK Invest stocks. Like most of the ARK Invest stocks have that binary growth element in which we know that the, the elbow of that growth curve is coming. And, and we don't know if it's in three years or in seven years, or in two years, but we know that growth curve is coming. So these are kind of more binary investments, much less predictable businesses. And because these businesses are, are, are very, very hard to predict, I can't possibly be comfortable having more than 10% of a total portfolio in those businesses um, whose returns are out in the future, way out in the future. And actually, if you've been following the channel, you know that, for example, Palantir, um, you know, I'm disappointed. It seems like Gotham, uh, their foundry business, not Gotham, their foundry business, it seems like the foundry business is not picking up like I anticipated. So so the growth is not predictable anymore, which is why I'm considering reducing my position in Palantir and moving Palantir in one of these more exponential slash binary growth, growth curves. Um, but of course, when, when a stock tends to become more binary, more exponential, more pre-revenue, if it works out, 
if it works out, right? You can do a 10X, you can do a 20X. So just because a stock in this, is in this category doesn't mean that it can't contribute tremendously to a portfolio. It can, it, it can actually contribute tremendous amounts of growth on the portfolio if you're right. This is more of a VC type type of, of, of management, right? You would more manage these investments like you would a, a, a VC and you would put most most of your eggs, you would put logically in the, in the companies for, for who you have the biggest conviction. So today I will be covering my highest conviction stocks. But before I do, let me know there will be a part two and a part three, uh, and I'll be focusing on how I do diversification with it, my part two segment, which is right here. And I'll be focusing on these binary slash revenue or pre-revenue stocks, uh, all of the ARK Invest stocks. I'll be focusing this in a third segment. Before I do, to begin with the series, I do have to say one more thing, which is, you know, the growth portfolio is, 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 is not everything. You know, when you do proper investing and proper asset planning and you try to prepare yourself for denominator growth, i.e. for the, 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 the US dollar becoming less and less valuable, which is the purpose of the channel, preparing for the devaluation of the US dollar for the coming inflation, which is just going to get worse and get worse as countries are in debt and as we advance in, in the, the, the fiat money era and how fiat money usually ends up, which is, a, as Charlie Munger says, you know, over 100 years, you can be certain the currency will be worthless. Anyways, because of the topic of a channel, I'm also covering two other thirds, which is the other third, which is my bond alternatives. And I have a lot of Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is part of uh, of my bond alternatives. Most of my bond alternative portfolio is Bitcoin. Um, but I don't include it in the growth portfolio, right? Because I, because that may, doesn't make no sense. And I also have savings account stocks, you know, that I consider Google, for example, as a savings account type of stock. Uh, you know, really not 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 much growth ahead, but, but, but really is going to keep up with inflation. These bond alternatives, I cover also in the channel and then I haven't covered much yet but the whole idea of leverage and leveraging real estate I think is a very important way that you can actually short the US dollar and short monetary printing through leveraged real estate and you know at least a good primary home so these two buckets right here are important buckets uh, that I'm not covering in this video so just just keep that in mind some stocks fit in the bond alternative bucket that's not what I'm covering here so now that I've put that aside let me tell you about how I um, derive highest conviction how I get to deciding whether a stock is going to be in that category of the highest conviction um, so that's my first category. That's the highest conviction. Um, and why? Why is this category? Um, why? Why is this category what I call tier one? Why is this category? the highest conviction. Yeah, and you can see that I have Tesla. Tesla is the biggest position in that category. And then I have Enphase as a much smaller position in that category. And that category is 20 to 25% of my portfolio at all And it all depends uh, with the fluctuations of Tesla, quite frankly. You know, if, if, if Tesla doubles again, I might have you know, 40% of a portfolio be Tesla. So, so uh, uh, you know, that's why the, these percentages are fluctuate, right? They're fluctuating. But why, why do I think there should be a spot in my portfolio for highest conviction? Because conviction is your truth. I've used that before in videos. When, when you talk about your truth, your truth is not someone else's truth. Your truth is not someone else's opinion. Your truth is not even a vote from people, you know, watching your YouTube channel or, or people agreeing with you on Twitter. No, your truth, your truth is something that you, you arrive on your own, you know, without YouTube, from first principles, from critical thinking, from, from thought experiments in your mind. You arrive to your truth on your own without outside influence. And this is very, very, very hard to do, you know. And, and you know, I, I don't claim that I do it perfectly because there's always some outside influence going on but at least you try to be as conscious as possible of outside influence and you try to arrive to your truth on your own and let me walk you through for example why i've concluded that tesla is my truth and that tesla is to me and not not necessarily to anybody else that's why portfolios are very personal but to me tesla i believe is is, is gonna be my winning company in my portfolio 
right? That doesn't mean, that, at all points in time, you're going to have dozens of companies who are going to be winning. But you, you got to pick the one in which you have the most conviction, the one that you're going to stick with for the longest time. That's why this is called conviction waiting, conviction weighted video. And I have very high conviction in, in Tesla. And this, this is linked to uh, my personal interests and, 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 and my past, just like everybody arrives to their truth based on what they've lived and the experience that they've lived. And so, for example, for me, you know, may, maybe too much information, I don't, I don't know. But for example, I worked at a dealership for two years uh, in, the, in, the 20, in, the, in the 2010s between age 18 and 20. And I remember how dysfunctional, how unethical the dealership business is. I I just I just have nightmares of it sometimes when I think about it. I I, rem, I, I remember that industry, and, and and you know to me it makes fundamental sense that cars should be bought online. Entirely, hundred percent makes a lot of sense. Some much better experience, much 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 better experience. You know, I am part of those. I think 80, 70 to eighty percent of Americans who absolutely hate going to a dealership. And, and, and there, is only, there is only one car right now that you can buy outside of a dealership. It's Tesla, right? Um, maybe some of the tiny competitors that don't matter to Tesla, like, um, you, you know, like, like say, a, a Rivian or a Lucid, those tiny competitors, sure, you can sit online. But most, most regular car brands, when you go online and you configure your vehicle online, you're going to have to be referred to a dealership and you're going to have to deal, to deal with a dealership. And, and, you know, my experience is that... I, I have a repulsion to dealerships. So obviously, that's a big part of investing in Tesla. So that's going to be my truth. But you know what else is my truth? Well, I've spent a lot of time st studying in, 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 in my life. And I've read a lot of books. And, and some of the books that I've read, for example, are books about the PayPal mafia. And how the PayPal mafia thinks. You know Elon Musk is part of the PayPal mafia, right? Founded PayPal with X.com and Peter Thiel. They merged, right? And there's a whole history as to how this, this, this PayPal mafia um, train of thought, how they operate, how they think about business. You know, they've revolutionized business. You know, I used to, you know, the book Zero to One by Heart by Peter Thiel, right? Notes on Startup, absolutely amazing book. Uh, Clay Christensen's Innovator, Innovator's Dilemma, right? Um, I've studied so, all of this stuff. I've studied, I've studied as much disruption in, in uh, disruption books. Like I've studied so many disruption books. Uh, that, that it's my truth. It's my, like disruption is score to my investment thesis in Tesla and I recognize patterns in Tesla that I don't think one would recognize if you, if you haven't say for example read zero to one you know how how good is your knowledge of zero to one right and if you if you have a good knowledge of zero to one you realize that you realize that, that Tesla is, is an overwhelmingly uh, winning company. It's 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 tough to see a future where Tesla doesn't win. Quite frankly, um, um, and, and moving on, you know, I, I also know other things. You know, I know that the transition to electric cars is inevitable, not because they are green. And this is like some something that people will invest would we, we dismiss. A Electric car companies, for example, they'll dismiss. They say, "Oh, they're not green." Well, that's not the selling point, because you know, because they'll say there's lithium. They'll say, "Oh, we make the energy from natural gas." That's not the main selling point of an electric car. The selling point of an electric car is that they are technology, technologically superior. You know, just 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 look at all these comparison of this Tesla Model S. You know, the Plaid model flooring the model and you can see the Tesla Model S Plaid beat cars that are gas cars that are like $500,000 in the zero to 100 miles an hour. It's it's just a better technology. And by the way, the Tesla is a fraction of the cost. It's just a better technology. And I know that better technologies win. Better technologies have always won, right? Oil won over um, farmers walking in the field, you know. The printing press won over monks copying book, right? AC won, AC electricity, alternating current won over DC, right? Cars won over horses. Higher technologies always win. When you have a superior technology, is always win. And, you know, that's one of the fundamental uh, uh, points of the book Zero to One, is when, when a company is 10 times better, at least 10 times better, you have a zero to one move and people are just going to move to it because it makes no sense to stick with the old technology. I believe that Tesla's and the electric cars in general, I'm going to get to the competition in a minute, Tesla's and electric cars in general are the superior technology. They are 7 to 13 times cheaper to power than gas 
cars. And by the way, that's using American gas prices. I'm not using European gas prices. I would never, not even dare doing a calculation in Europe. And so for, for the average person, if you don't drive a lot, that's going to be eight, that's going to be $4,000 maybe in savings. If you don't drive a lot, if you drive a lot, that's going to be $8,000 in saving. Right, pre-tax saving. You don't have to pay taxes on that money that you used to spend, right? It's just a saving. Savings are tax-free, right? So Tesla is a product that literally yields 15 to 25 percent in savings, like literally. Like you, you can literally pay your car payment if you decide to go that route with what you would have paid in gas, right? What you would have paid in gas for savings cover your car payment. Like it's 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 stunning. It's a technology that's going to get adopted. We're just we're just at the beginning of the S curve, and you know they don't advertise that because they can't make enough cars. That's the reason. But as soon as they advertise this, did you know that Teslas are so cheap to drive? As soon as they advertise this, like I bet you this is, this is something that most people don't realize, and most people most people don't realize how cheap electric cars are to drive. They are very very inexpensive to drive. Oh by the way, they last much longer, two to three times longer than gas cars. Right? Tesla got started with a million mile warranty. That was a big selling point today. Why do they last longer? Very logical. You know, a motor, an electric motor, is a rotor and a stator. That's it. You have hundreds of parts in a gas engine. That's it. Moving parts, basic, it's a basic component of design. Right? Good, good design is few moving parts. The more moving parts you have, the more opportunities for failure you have. So, of course, gas cars are not going to last as long as electric cars, it's not possible. It's just not possible. The range is now in line with gas cars, but the range is going to get, and I've, I've said that in my, my Tesla series, the range is going to get much better over time, much better. I fundamentally believe in my study of technology and cost curves and declining cost curves, I fundamentally believe by, that by 2030, we'll have cars with a 3,000 mile range. And if you have a car with a 3,000 mile range, you know, there's no, there's no winning. Any, any, anyways, anyways, let me move on. Let me move on. You know, what else? Right? It, 95, like people bring up chargers against Tesla. Well, 95% of people use, use their, use their char chargers at home. They just charge the car overnight at home, just like you would do a cell phone. So that's going to be cheap, cheap, cheap. And by the way, Tesla has a charger network anyway, but I believe that charger network is mostly to alleviate the fears of people. Right? And the cost to quality ratio of those cars keep increasing. It's a technology. So so maybe the, the, the price tag or the sticker tag maybe is gonna stay in the thirty to forty grand, but the technology of those cars is gonna get better. And if you follow Tesla, you know I'm not even in you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You you fully know that if you're following Tesla. I'm just talking about cars. I'm not gonna talking about any other potential business of Tesla. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Let me let me move on because this is not the test this is not a Tesla video, but this is an illustration of how I arrive at my thoughts about Tesla. So first thought is the best technology. And then of course critical thinking. So you gotta you gotta create your truth. So I hear people tell me competition is coming. I've heard that for years, right? Um, and so and so when I hear that, when I hear that, I tell myself, well, who will be able to, uh, like competition's coming, okay, well, who's going to be able to produce these cars? Who's going to be able to do that? Um, and I think only Tesla is going to be able to produce cars to meet the demand. So you're going to have people who buy Teslas because there's no alternative, because there's no other cars out there, because there are only ones that can make them. You know, legacy businesses have tremendous inertia. That will prevent them to shift quick enough. That's the key of S-curves. Demands in S-curve happens, they happen very slow at first. Demand is very, very slow at first. And then demand is sudden and overwhelming. And my viewpoint is that demand for electric cars come 2024, 2026 will be sudden and overwhelming. To the point that growing your production by 2030, that's going to be too late. You need to be able to provide these cars now. I believe only the Chinese competition is credible. And, you know, with tariffs, that's going to be a hard sell in the U.S. Um, to, to bring in Chinese cars because of the tariffs. And we'll see how Chinese cars fare in Europe. I believe, I believe Chinese competition is credible. But I do not believe a second 
but legacy competition is credible. And this has everything to do with what I told you, Clay Christensen's the innovator's dilemma. I don't, I don't believe that. And, and one of the key, there's many reasons why I believe that, but one of the key reasons uh, that I believe that is because they're, they're just not going to be able to, to throw money at that problem. They're not going to be able to afford it. Um, let me tell you about the debt of Legacy Auto. Volkswagen, $377 billion in liabilities. GM, $191 billion in liabilities. Ford, $212 billion in liabilities. Toyota, $328 billion in liabilities. As of today, I looked it up. Went, went, on, went on the balance sheet and looked it up. The, this big four have $1.1 trillion of debt. They have $1.1 trillion of debt. Tesla has $36 billion of debt. $1.1 trillion. Okay. And Tesla is growing sales at 50%, making four times as much profits on their car. They are losing money on electric cars. That they have to make the move to. And, you know, some people may tell me, well, you know, why, why, why do I include the, their financial divisions in that debt? Because, you know, they try to trick people and they say, oh, this is long-term debt. This is, this is a GM finance. Well, no, I'm going to group it together. You know what? Because these companies have been engaging to grow, right? For the past five, ten years, they've been engaging in revenue financing. If I tell you about revenue financing, it's because you may have heard of a great American company, General Electric, who literally... I mean, went very close to bankruptcy because of revenue financing. Tesla doesn't do, doesn't do revenue financing. What is revenue financing? That's when you have a client, a customer that comes in, maybe questionable credit. They come in to the GM dealership and they want to buy a $90,000 gas truck. And then you have GM Financial says, we'll finance it for you. Not a problem. We'll finance your gas truck. The lease math actually works the same way as well. Um, and then either the customer walks away or the, the, the customer walks away from the lease or does not buy out the car after the lease because the price of the truck has halved. Because in 2025, when it becomes clear that fueling a truck is 10 bucks versus 120 bucks, when that is very, very clear in 2025 and people just want electric trucks, what's going to happen to the value of that $90,000 truck? Right? It's going to be worth 40 and maybe 30, and maybe even less. So you're left with, with a truck that has lost 60-70% of its value. So these companies, I believe, are going to have together, you know, what? Maybe half a trillion of markdowns over the next decade? Like, like this is this is just insane. And so this is another thing that you may that you may tell me, right? Because people are not gonna buy their car. Like, if you sign a lease on a truck and you have a buyout option for sixty thousand after a three year lease, and you see that the value of your truck in the market is forty thousand, you're gonna get that truck back to GM Financial, and then GM Financial is gonna be stuck with the loss. So revenue financing is extremely risky. It's a fragile way to, be, to do business. It's a fragile way to be business. Tesla does not do any of that. So Tesla is anti-fragility, and I would say anti-fragility redefined. They have almost no liabilities. Much of this is related to, their, to, um, to, to a lot of their agreements with suppliers, by the way. So it's not that big. That, that, that liability is not that big. Anyways, um, Another thing you may say is, oh, but there's going to be another web bailout. Well, if there's going to be another bailout, by the way, uh, well, first of all, it would be really, really tough to get a bailout to just one car company. So Tesla would probably get money. And by the way, and this is this is what, when you hear, for example, like there's like a big trend in investing, say in Ford, for example, you'd get wiped out. Like if there was a bailout, as the shareholders get wiped out and there is a bailout, you know. And furthermore, and I'll finish with that, Legacy Auto has other problems. There's a problem of dealerships and dealership laws, and dealerships are fighting really, really, really hard to defend their business. That's why in so many states, so many states have passed laws that allow Tesla to only have five showrooms. You can't have more than five showrooms, so Tesla has to sell online because otherwise they have to go into dealerships. Dealerships give a lot of money to local politicians, and dealerships are not going to go without a fight. And because we are not going to go without a fight, this is going to hurt Legacy Hoto, because Legacy Hoto is not going to be able to undercut the dealerships. And if you watch some of the videos I've made, you see, you see issues with, with markups and market adjustments all over the dealership spectrum. Dealerships are a big issue. Another issue is technical debt. You have tremendous technical debt. 
You know, I remember watching the Sandy Monroe videos, you know, talking about the software at the old, you know, companies. They're not tech companies. They run software from the 80s. Right. Then you have the unions. How are the unions going to react when obviously you need to start by cutting a third of the workforce to transition in electric? Because you need to. Because electric cars are much simpler. It's a rotor and a stator. So how are they going to react? Do you think they're going to go without a fight? No, they're not going to go without a fight. Unions are very good at fighting. So I don't, I don't believe a second that legacy auto is a threat. So back to my conviction, and let me just finish here with my conviction. So I have other things that are fundamental about the business that I like. It's a big market cap. It's in the indices, right? It's, it's so, so, so you're protected against that 90% drawdown. Okay, you're not protected against 90 per, uh, 70 or 60% drawdown, but you're protected against the 90% drawdown because you have buyers at the margin that are always there because of ind indices. It's in the big indices, right? There's outstanding revenue growth. The revenue growth does not slow down. I can follow the stock of Tesla. I follow the stock of Tesla as car. The Model Y in the US is still at an all-time low as of today, right? So, so the cars are getting, so they have tremendous cash flows. Cash flows are actually growing much faster than revenue. So check on all the fundamentals of the business. And then what else, you know, because conviction is personal. I have familiarity with a product. In fact, I drive a Tesla whenever I can. I don't own one, but if I have to rent a car, I'm going to try to rent a Tesla. And I have friends that have Teslas and I can tell you it's, it's the best experience ever. I love, I love that product and I just love the product. So if you hate the product, that makes sense that you would not have conviction in Tesla if you hate the product. But I love the product, right? Uh, I have family with the market and how the product is sold because I have experience with dealership. You know, I drive every day. There's not a day I don't drive, right? I have I have familiarity with a pain point. It's solved, right? Going to the gas station. Me, I don't have a reason to go to, to, to go to the gas station except to fuel my car. Like, but you know, if if you if say you 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 smoke or if say you, I don't know you you buy gas station beer or something, then then you wouldn't understand that this is a pain point because you gotta go to the gas station to buy cigarettes anyways. But to me, it's a tremendous pain to go to the gas station. So I see that pain point being solved by having a car that I can just plug into the garage and not having to go to the gas station. You know. And lastly, and this is the end of my conviction, why it's my highest conviction, things that you don't find in the other things, in the other companies, you know, for example, Mercado Libre. I love Mercado Libre, but I, I, I don't live in Brazil, right? I, I can't see how good they're doing because I don't live in Brazil, but I live in America. That's the biggest market of Texas. And I see adoption in America. I see Teslas more and more every year. I assume, I assume if I lived in California, it'd be even worse. So I see the exponential adoption of Tesla in front of my eyes whenever I drive in literally America's number one oil and gas state. You know, people, I mean, you have, you have in Texas, you have oil and gas license plates. And, and, and it's, 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 you know, it's part of a culture. They love oil and gas here. And I see Teslas everywhere in, the, in oil and gas country. So if I see Teslas everywhere in oil and gas countries, you can bet, you, I mean, no investment advice, but I bet, I'm betting that it's, it's the technology. The technology is just better. When it is so cheap, people are just going to flock to buy these cars because it costs $7 to fill up your car. It costs $7 to fill up your car, but... I have another conviction in another stock, which is Enphase. And Enphase is another energy independence stock, uh, which, which, by the way, um, could take that down of charging your car to, to, to just about zero um, because, because the other revolution that, that, I, that, that my conviction is so high uh, that I'm comfortable going past, say, a 5% allocation that would be Enphase. Enphase, I believe, is the category winner. It's 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 um, it's the winner of um, the the solar industry, in my view, because again, this is a technological story. Again, you know, Enphase has been growing sixty percent yearly for quite a while, and I, I I see I see that they are beginning their S curve, and I I think they're going to continue to grow at this rate for a decade plus because they are just at the tipping point of that S curve. You know drive around an American neighborhood, count solar panels today, drive around in a few years again, and count solar panels again. I've been doing that, and I see many, many more solar panels everywhere. And the odds are, if you have a solar panel installed on your house, the odds are they're going to have a microinverter. And 
Enphase is 99% of a microinverter market. Uh, microinverters, to me, are the way to play solar. Um, Enphase powers this, this energy independence revolution. So, you, you know, the, the business model is essentially you put the cheapest Chinese panel that you can on your roof, and then you put American technology, you put, um, you know, Enphase tech. Um, and, and Enphase tech powers pa powers your, your whole system. And, you know, if you look at, at an energy system with, with Enphase, it's about a five-year, it's about a five-year payoff, you know. And I have I have direct experience with Enphase. Uh, you may have seen my video. I went to a trade show recently, talked to nine solar installers. Every single one of them recommended Enphase. Every single one of them. Most of them actually mostly carried Enphase. They have won the installer market and keep in mind you need to go through an installer if you're going to get solar because there's all of this permitting that they have to do and they have to have all of the city um, permits and, and insurance etc etc so to me Enphase is a winning technology let me just let me just go on as to why you know actually it's my truth you know what else well you have the crazy inflation reduction act money which is just like for Tesla, if you put an end phase roof, you're getting $7,500. So imagine a situation where a household were to A, buy a electric car, not just a Tesla, right? Any electric car, um, and then B, put solar panels. Well, you get a $15,000 tax write-off. I mean, I mean, this this is like these products are so gonna get adopted. It's not even funny, and, and it's a product that, by the way, you you would have adopted without without the, the tax credit but that tax credit like you're gonna you know for most people you're gonna erase your taxes the year you make the switch um on, on both an electric and an end phase system and sure enough i believe in combos i believe i believe eventually this will be combos you know you, where, where you have roof the roof a solar roof that just just powers your cars and charges your car and you have free energy and um you know, the, 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 the U.S. also is essentially going to pay Enphase a bunch of money, about 40 bucks for each inverter it makes. You know, and when I look at their margin, I'm like, okay, well, most of the cost of goods sold of Enphase are going to be paid by U.S. subsidies. So Enphase is like overbuilding plants right now and engaging in like overcapacity to build as many as they can in the U.S. because they're going to get the subsidies a little bit like Tesla is doing everything it can to produce batteries in the U.S. right now because there, there are very, very miscalculated subsidies from the government. And, 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 you know, I'm sorry, they are miscalculated. And why do I believe that? Well, uh, that's also based on my experience, right? I actually worked in the solar panel business for one year in 2010 in Europe. And you may remember Europe had crazy feed in tariffs. All over Europe, you had feed in tariffs. And I remember seeing an, very savvy entrepreneurs just just putting solar panel on every single piece of property that they owned. I remember homeowners going crazy to put solar panels everywhere because they did the math. They did the math and they, 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 reali they realized that by putting a solar panel on your home, you could make a 20 to 25% return reselling to the grid for like 20 years or 25 years. So people did the math. And when you do the math, these products whether it's an electric car or free energy by way of solar energy, these products sell themselves. And the same, by the way, is true for batteries today. Like batteries are actually an investment now in a, in a lot of name-free type marketplaces where you have peak prices where they can buy your electricity sometimes for a few bucks a kilowatt hour. So you store energy, and then whenever you have a feed-in tariff, the software just unloads the battery into the grid, right? And you have like a 20 or 30 kilowatt battery that gets unloaded into the grid at three bucks a kilowatt hour, right? So you just end up making, whenever there's a peak, you make a few hundred bucks. Whenever there's a peak, and there can be a lot of peaks because the grid is very unstable. So end phase is my truth too. And, 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 you know, I don't want to spend too much time on end phase. I, I definitely cover end phase a lot on this channel. So I need, I need to like, show some restraint. Um, um, but let me show you an example of a company that could not be faulted, but that is not my truth. And, and you know, that's why I say it's, it, 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 it's not about, uh, right? Every portfolio is going to be different and your portfolio is going to be based on your experience. And let me show you, I'm going to talk about NVIDIA now, which is, NVIDIA is a wonderful company. 
and and but to me nvidia is is a company that i have in my tier two in my middle why is nvidia in my middle and not nvidia a 20 percent position like it is for many people because nvidia you know i can come with a thesis but nvidia is not going to be my truth because i don't i just don't know nvidia as well as i know energy independence and electricity and cars i just don't know it as well but Let's look at a profile for who NVIDIA could be the truth. It all depends on your profile. So let's imagine this profile. Imagine you are a gamer. You've been a gamer your whole life. You've played games your whole life, had a nice PC your whole life. Uh, and uh, you've seen the NVIDIA products that you were buying back in, you know, 09, 2010. You've seen them get 100x better in a decade. Right? You've seen them get so much better. You have had a habit of waiting in line 20 hours at Micro Center because you know the value of these things and you know these things that sell like hotcakes. You know the value of these things. So you, you've had that experience with fellow purchasers of GPUs waiting in line, bonding, trying to buy a GPU, trying to get your hands on a, a, a beloved GPU, right? It's, it's a culture. It's a culture to who it's the truth. You know, uh, you've been sad to see GPUs being scalped, people trying to resell them to you on eBay for a future and seeing tourists buy them and fly back to their country and sell them, flip them for extra money, right? Maybe because you're a gamer, because you have had experience building PCs, maybe you work in tech somewhere, maybe, you, maybe you're maybe data center tech, maybe you work for a big data center, for a big tech firm, and maybe last month, you just saw your company write a $300,000 check for 25 A100s, right? Which is their latest data center focused GPU, right? And so you see you see products like this and, and, and you know, you, you, see, you see like a purchase order uh, within your company and, and you see your company just, just, just buying 10 of these for $135,000, right? I mean, that's, and by the way, it's out of stock because you know it's out of stock and you follow it. And you're like, okay, company asked me to buy 10 of these for 135,000 bucks. And you use, you use the P card to buy this on behalf of a company. It's, you, you know what I mean? It's like this, if you see this, I understand how NVIDIA is going to be your truth. And I understand how you would have conviction to own NVIDIA and, 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 and have NVIDIA a position that would look unreasonable to anybody who does not have this truth. And you could not be faulted to buy NVIDIA, because when I look at the performance of NVIDIA over the past 10 years, right, 53%. The performance of NVIDIA is in line with the performance of Tesla, which is in line with the performance of Enphase. These are all top stocks. There's going to be a dozen of top stocks out there that can produce this type of 50% a year return. Stunning. But to have conviction, you need the stock to be your truth. And I'll give you a simple example. You know, I can't have huge conviction in Nvidia because I don't fit this mold, right? So, 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 so to me, like, like recently, I sold Nvidia because I find Nvidia overvalued, right? I sold it because I can't have that conviction because I don't live in this world and thus I do not see it. But I do see Teslas everywhere and I do see roofs in my neighborhood getting solar panels everywhere, you know. And I look at the roof sometimes sideways, and I try to see a microinverter, and guess what? Most of the time I see a microinverter when I go walk in my neighborhood. So I see revolutions happen in my day-to-day -day life for Tesla and for Enphase, and because NVIDIA is not my day-to-day -day life, because I'm not, I'm not a gamer, and I don't work in data centers, I don't work in tech, I, I am not equipped with the conviction necessary to hold NVIDIA through everything that happens in the world, right? You know, I, I, I don't have that, but I have that conviction for Tesla and I have that conviction for Enphase. But if someone has that profile, they definitely would have that conviction for NVIDIA and they would not ever sell their N NVIDIA position just because some metric tells them it's overvalued because they have a very, 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 very strong conviction in the big picture. So conviction is personal conviction is personal portfolio education uh, portfolio allocation has to do with what is your truth and so i'll conclude by saying this this is my truth i believe every company i invest in to be very high quality 
But these companies are obviously not as much my truth as these because, for example, I've never tried the Hims products. For example, I've never tried the CrowdStrike product. I don't work in the data space. You know, I don't work in the military. I don't live in Brazil. So I have layers of risk that push me to diversify much more for these stocks than I would for a stock like Tesla or Enphase, where I believe I've, I've uncovered much, much of the risks and, and answered the question. But depending on your experience, any of these, any of these stocks, and keep in mind, these are just example stocks, any, any stock could become your truth depending on your experience. Like it all, it all depends on your experience. You know, maybe, maybe you uh, were a sergeant in the military and you've walked with Gotham and you know how good Gotham is because you've used it. You have hands-on experience. You've seen things that, you know, others have not seen and then it would make sense for you to you to put Palantir in there and for Palantir to be your conviction. But you, you can't borrow the conviction of someone else because if you borrow the conviction of someone else, whenever there's poor news on the stock or whenever there's some, so, some fear in the market, you're going to sell. That makes sense. So, so it needs to be you. And, and, and in my view, for a stock to be a tier one stock, you need to, 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 to see Per your analysis, a perfect alignment of planets, your planets. There needs to be a perfect thing, a perfect alignment of your planets. And so me, the perfect alignment for me exists for those stocks. You know, why? Because I have a hands-on experience with their industry, their product, and their country. Right? I I, I have a hands-on experience in the countries where we operate, the product and the industry, right? I know the numbers that I look for, and they have near-perfect numbers with no speed bumps in the road. By the way, a lot of these companies, to me, also have near-perfect numbers with no speed bumps in the road. But I'm not familiar with country or industry as much as I am familiar with this country and this industry. Right? Right? I see clear long-term trends that I truly believe I understand to the utmost of my capability. Right? There's, there's, There's... there's things, for example, especially in some of the software stock, that maybe I understand only 80% of it. Right? I don't believe I understand 99% of it. These stocks, I believe I understand much closer to the I-90%. Right? So again, you're covering yourself against ignorance by diversifying. But you know, if you're an NVIDIA follower, you've been following for 10 years, you may understand NVIDIA much more than I do. And so you don't need that diversification that I need. Right? And I also strongly, and that's that's also because I'm in my thirties, uh, and I would I would argue if, if you're like in if you're like nineteen, uh, binary risk should should um, should, should sh- I mean uh, no investment advice, but 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 it, it, it would make sense to to uh, to be less scared because you have more time to make it up. But but me, you know, I've been I've been working for a while. Like it's like I don't I don't I don't I don't I don't want to lose everything. Um, you know, like, like, like someone could think it's okay if you're like 18 years old. And so that's the reason why I would never put a company that is binary, that has a binary outcome, like an open door or like a Coinbase, um, as asymmetric as that risk may be, right? A company may be binary, but have much, much more risk to the upside than the downside. It doesn't matter if if there is a, a large amount of, of binary, it's 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 too risky in my view to put this as a tier one. Um, so, anyways, I will be covering more in depth the, the the diversified part of the portfolio. So, portfolio where I mostly cover myself against my own ignorance uh, and those binary stocks. I'll be cover. I'll be doing a part two and a part three for this very video. Please stay tuned and and hopefully you can see it. Thank you so much for watching. This was not investment advice. This is not investment advice. Just literally me sharing my my, my journey and how I do this, uh, how I do this, how I do it. This is just entertainment. Thank you. If you can like, appreciate it. Thanks for subscribing. Really appreciate that. Thank you and have a wonderful day.